Good evening, Piney Grove Church family. Uh, tonight, uh, I will be furthering the discussion on what makes a, a healthy church. As uh, you're watching this recording, uh, I, I am um, not in the office, of course, and uh, we are taking a little retreat, uh, and so we are uh, hopefully enjoying that midweek. Uh, but I come to you today with uh, a furthering of the question, what makes a healthy church? You know, some of the things we've already spoke about was a biblical exposition, which concerns how one preaches or even teaches. Uh, we spoke about the gospel being center to the health of the church. Uh, we spoke about uh, last week, we tr uh, spoke about true conversion. And what that looks like, true conversion, is not just simply a term. For instance, I've converted from one religion to another. The biblical idea and truth of conversion is that there is something life-changing that happens, transformative even. And if you recall last week, we said that that one thing that is transformative is the gospel. And so how does this affect a healthy church? Well, when you have members in the church that are converted in the truest sense, then you have a healthy, a healthy church. Uh, that helps us to move into tonight's discussion on evangelism. I had a conversation as I'm recording this uh, a little bit earlier in the day, a conversation with an individual that was speaking about, uh, had a conversation with a person on on encouraging and being uh, being on mission, and uh, he made the comment that uh, for far too long the church hasn't encouraged other people as they should, or have uh, been sharing their faith as they should, or they might say something like, "Well, that's not my job," insinuating that evangelism and missions is the job of the pastor alone, and that's not the case. In fact, I made the uh, I made the assumption, not the assumption, but the uh, you know, but the comment that all believers, all Christ followers, in some regard and in some way are theologians who study God, about God, and also evangelists that we share in the good news of who Jesus is. Now, tonight I'm going to be speaking to you about evangelism and, and, and how that helps the health of the church. It almost seems like it is a no-brainer that when one is engaged in evangelism, uh, they are also investing in the kingdom of God and investing rightly in the kingdom of God by sharing the good news will hopefully ensure uh, that we are, if you will, helping to build and enable a healthy church. So tonight I want to talk to you about uh, evangelism. So the question is, what makes a healthy church? Well, evangelism is what makes a healthy church, just one of many different ways to, to answer that. We're going to talk about how evangelism is a distinguishing mark of a healthy church, a church that is alive and vibrant in Christ, is also a church where missions is at the core. Uh, I've said this before, and I'm not the only one that, that has brought up this point. Individuals in the body of Christ are engaged in the gospel, or should be, in at least three different ways. We are either going, going out, we are either equipping those to go by teaching, or thirdly, uh, we are giving resources to help send out. In some regard, we must, as Christ followers, be engaged in one of those three areas of evangelism. I would hope that we would all, in some way, be engaged in the telling aspect of, of evangelism. So we're going to talk about um, having the gospel and evangelism consistently running through the life of the church, and we are going to hopefully... Uh, clear up some misconceptions that one might have uh, about evangelism. Acts chapter 5 and verse 20 says this, uh, Paul is, um, uh, the apostles are arrested and, and freed. And uh, this is 
This is actually uh, before Paul comes onto the scene. Uh, but uh, the book of Acts, chapter 5, and verse 20 reads this. Let me, let me back up to verse 17. Uh, this is um, these scriptures um, that we see with Peter uh, primarily. And so we pick up at 5 at verse 20 that says, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. The life of the Christ follower. The life of one that follows Jesus. And when they heard this, they entered the temple and at daybreak and began to teach. So wherever they were at uh, in life, they were uh, encouraged to... Uh, to share uh, of this way of life. Well, I'm a Christ follower because of this. Or you might say, I'm a Christ follower because of this. And it gives you opportunity to share, um, to share the faith, share your faith in, uh, in Jesus. So let's talk about a biblical understanding of evangelism. When I say the word evangelism, what do you think of? Or maybe I might use a word that's kind of similar that sounds like evangelical. You may have heard that word. Uh, let me just go ahead and say, when I use evangelism or evangelical, I'm not using this in a political term. Sometimes evangelical, uh, that term is interjected into the political arena. Uh, when I use the word, I'm not talking about it in the political sense. I'm speaking about it, how it engages in uh, evangelism, uh, the sharing of our faith. And so we're going to talk about having a biblical understanding, the practice of evangelism. What does this look like in the Bible? And um, how can we learn uh, what evangelism is, is not? So let me say this. Evangelism is not a putting forth of our personal beliefs on others. Uh, and what I mean by that is the gospel is the gospel. It has nothing to do with my own personal beliefs, although I personally believe in the gospel. The gospel of Christ is not just my simple personal belief. The gospel is a fact. Uh, it is not something that I have interjected in my life and have seasoned it with my, own, uh, with my own opinions of what it is. The gospel is the gospel, and it doesn't need uh, any of my own humanistic interjections uh, within it. It is a, um, it is, it's not belief, nor is it mere, uh, a mere opinion. So, when we approach evangelism, I, I'm not giving somebody my personal beliefs when I share the good news of Jesus. I'm giving them the fact of the matter and not my own opinion. Although they, although the world might see this as, well, that's your opinion, we understand it as Christ's people as more than just my own beliefs, okay? So it is not uh, putting in our own beliefs about the gospel. It is not forcing anyone to become a Christ follower. It presents the truth. Uh, in fact, we can't save anyone. That should be something that you, uh, that you would hear often. We can't bring anyone to, to faith. It is only through the work of the Holy Spirit, but... We pursue and share uh, as if every opportunity we have, God is going to save that person. Now, we don't know who God is going to save. We are to be uh, obedient to, to that call. So, it is not forcing anyone to believe it, that we, uh, to force someone to believe uh, in Christ. We can't force anybody. Uh, it is not, uh, to be a Christ follower, it is not a, quote-unquote, religion of coercion, uh, meaning I can't hold you at gunpoint or by the end of the sword and say, believe in Christ or die. Uh, and there are world religions that do that, do that uh, belief by coercion, which is, which is not true belief or conversion at all. Remember, we talked about conversion last week. True conversion uh, won't happen at the end of the sword. It won't happen at the end of a gun. It is by the Spirit of God and He and he alone. Now, listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. So we, we say it is not forcing anyone. It's presenting the truth, and then, and then God does the work. Okay, so listen to these verses. Uh, Paul is, is talking about 
Um, he is talking about divisions in, in the church, and every church has divisions. But I want you to listen to what he says uh, in verse 6. He said, I planted, uh, uh, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Now listen to verse 7. Now neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Okay, so it's not opinion. Uh, we just, we're just called to be obedient. But only God is who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So we can't force anyone to believe, uh, although sometimes we want to shake somebody and say, can't you just believe in Jesus? But that's not really uh, faith at that point. And so we don't believe in coercion. It is not a personal testimony, although we can use personal testimony to share our faith. So, um, my conversion in, in Christ should be the same as, as yours, but the details might be slightly different. So, I believed in Jesus. I heard the gospel. That's the constant. I heard the gospel, but I was in an evangelism service. Somebody might have been at a youth camp, or, or somebody could have been farther along in you know, in this world as far as age and in sin, and some people might have been born again at an early age. So evangelism is not necessarily your personal testimony, although you can, and I would suggest, using your testimony to share the good news. Um, and sometimes I find that uh, when we share our testimony, sometimes I have heard people forget, actually forget to share uh, the gospel, you know, uh, I remember hearing a guy uh, give a testimony one time, and, and it has happens quite a bit. You get a guy who has, we talked about conversion last week, who was this way, come out of that lifestyle, and has been changed by Jesus. And so, we call a guy in, I hear, heard this testimony, this guy was wrapped up in, in all kinds of, uh, you know, he was in drugs, he was in male prostitution, he was... You know, he was engaged in all these things, and I'm sitting there listening to a 45-minute testimony of the way that he used to be, and about maybe five minutes of it, if that, was expounding on the, on the gospel. And if we're honest with ourselves, that we just like the juicy tidbits of gossip. That's not the gospel, though. Uh, when, in fact, I should give my testimony, if I'm going to do that, maybe spend the five or ten minutes telling that, and then the rest unpacking, unpacking the, the gospel. So, personal testimonies can be used, but we've got to be aware uh, that um, when we use it, it's got to have a full or a, a robust gospel message um, in, in that. It is not a social act either social um, social action or um, you know something we do uh, where we go out and do a good work. Uh, some might call this a social gospel. That term was used early, uh, early mid-1900s. Uh, and so we want the gospel to be more than just something that we do socially. A social action, a social gospel. Uh, the, the church does do many good works. In fact, you'll not find another organization in all of the world that, that does more humanitarian works and efforts than, than uh, Christ's church. The problem is, with the doing of good works, there ha also needs to be a proclamation of the good news. Why are we doing good works? What has brought us to this point of doing good works? Now, a good way to look at good works accompanied by the message is through Samaritan's Purse, through Baptist on Mission, uh, North Carolina Baptist on Mission, and there's many other, many other organizations that operate through the church that not only do good works, working with their hands and serving others, but they also accompany that good work by telling the good news. And so if we have a good work and we only focus on the good work, that, is, that becomes a social gospel, and that social gospel doesn't save, doesn't save anyone. In fact, you can, you can probably find an organization that's already doing some of those things. They just aren't sharing the good news. 
And so it is not just a simple social action. The gospel is at the heart of all of the world missions. Uh, in let's say as early as the, you know in the 19th century, which resulted in true conversion and and the nations you know uh, hearing hearing the good news. Um, and so I would say that we can do good works, and I encourage we do good works. But I would also give an avenue to explain why we do the good works. Well, we do good works because of this. We want to bless you because of this. And we're able to share the love of Christ verbally. Okay, uh, Evangelism, not only is it not a social gospel, it is not apologetics. Okay, That just simply means a defense of the faith. Uh, now, I can use apologetics to defend the faith, but then somewhere I've got to get to the point where I'm sharing the gospel clearly. And what I mean by that, because apologetics is defending the, the faith, we're, we're trying to find uh, the answer strictly through defending and relying on objections people have and then, and then answering those objections about Christianity rather than just giving a clear demonstration. And sometimes we do have to have conversations to defend, uh, to defend, you know, the Bible and Christianity. But it must never stop on a mere defense. Okay, it must further, and it must go further, as we share our faith with other people. It is uh, apologetics is defensive. Okay, so we're defending. In fact, the word uh, that we're, where we get our word apology from uh, just simply means an offense. Now. Apologetics does, does not mean that somebody says, I'm sorry for, for being a Christian. Uh, far from it. In fact, the way we use the word apology today is a very westernized way, a very American way of, uh, of using the word. And it is, it is, uh, sometimes it can be a hindrance uh, when we interject our Western way of thinking into Scripture. The original Greek word for, for uh, defense meant, or uh, for apology, uh, just simply meant that we gave a defense. So be careful of how we use that term as well. Apologetics is a defense of the gospel. Say, for instance, somebody has an objection to the crucifixion or, or, or uh, to the resurrection. And we can lay out a defense of the resurrection. And there are good, good tools to use for the defense of the historical resurrection of, of, of Jesus. But it is just simply a, merely a defense. Whereas evangelism is the positive act of telling and proclaiming the good news about Christ. So I'm not saying that we should not use apologetics. As some would say, well, there's no place for it. I'm not one of those. I believe that we certainly can now, apologetics isn't going to save anyone, but it certainly can give one ear to hear, uh, to hear the message of the gospel. So if we use it, uh, again, just like personal testimony, it can be balanced rightly, but the balance always has to have the gospel heavier. Same thing with uh, apologetics. So we're talking apologetics. Uh, we can use apologetics, but the gospel must be weighed heavier. And so uh, just... Just know that. It is not, evangelism is not apologetics. Uh, and so uh, that's some, some important things to remember as we talk about sharing our faith, and which I think is very, very important for the church. A healthy church is also a church that is where all of her members in some way is on mission. Uh, and so that might be, again, that we are going, we are giving, or we are equipping the one of those three. And hopefully we are engaged in that as well. So, so those are some things as to what uh, evangelism is, is not. So we, we said that um, it, is, uh, it, is not, uh, it is not our personal beliefs. It's not opinion. It's not our personal testimony, although we can use testimony. It is not social. It is not a social gospel or some action that we do. It is not apologetics, and, uh, and it certainly doesn't come from 
uh, results. You know, uh, it, it, evangelism is not this thing where we just share the good news and then try to get numbers. Okay, sometimes people share the good news for years with people groups and they don't see any results of or any fruit for years to come. So uh, if we're looking in this thing to put another notch on the belt for the kingdom, uh, I think we've got our head in it in the wrong way. Okay, so it is not a numbers game. It is not chalking up another number. Uh, God does the work. God gets the increase. Uh, we just simply are called to be um, to be obedient. Sometimes people beat themselves up over not seeing numbers. I've just seen some of the SBC numbers for baptisms and membership and all that, and it's on the decline. Well, naturally, it's going to be on the decline. We haven't met since March. I mean, uh, people aren't coming, you know, people aren't uh, assembling as they were in the past. So obviously, we're going to see some decline in, in numbers, but we get saddened when we see these numbers. I, I think some of it is because we're so numbers-based and so numbers-driven that we get disheartened by, by seeing these numbers because we, we generally care that people, you know, that we're not seeing activity like we would like. And so it comes from a general and, you know, wanting to see people saved and so forth. But sometimes we get too invested in numbers. Okay, so evangelism is not putting another notch on the belt. Uh, it is not uh, pragmatic in that end because God does the work. Um, and so. All right, so let's talk about the biblical understanding. Uh, so we've talked about things that evangelism is, is not. Let's talk about the biblical understanding uh, and practice of, of evangelism. And so let's, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, like I, I mentioned earlier, evangelism uh, can be right, rightly and wrongly understood. It can be used in the wrong way and in the right way. So if I'm looking for another notch on the belt... Uh, you know, if I'm just playing a numbers game, then if I'm playing a numbers game and I'm just hearing people, you know, we, we want people to make profession of faith in Jesus and be saved. But if I'm just simply numbers based, then that means that my discipleship is almost non-existent. What happens when somebody, you know, confesses Christ as their Lord and, you know, for the forgiveness of their sins? Well, we ought to move into, uh, we ought to move into discipling. Okay, so if I'm numbers based simply numbers based, I might not have time to disciple. And so it can be wrongly and it can be rightly uh, motivated. So sometimes, again, it could be uh, wrongfully motivated by, by selfishness, um, perhaps, again, to put another notch on the belt, uh, maybe to get a reputation. Well, down the road, uh, so-and-so has led uh, 20 people to the Lord this last last week. Well, praise the Lord if that is true. Praise the Lord if that is true, and I pray for a revival there. Uh, but some would just merely elevate what they have done uh, by, uh, by sharing the faith. Now, we want to see people proclaim Jesus. We want to see that, but not but just based off of my reputation. Uh, in fact, the words echo in my head, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. So, evangelism when is, when is rightly motivated, when our motives are right, it is unselfish, okay? It is uh, seen through the lens of obedience and through love and genuine concern for the person and not just the number on the board, okay? So evangelism is, um, is unselfish and is, uh, is geared and grounded in obedience and in, in love because we want to we want to be obedient to what Christ said in the Great Commission, uh, that we are to go into all of the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Lord, uh, baptize them, them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all this as we go through life. Everything we do in life, uh, be constantly seeing and looking how we can make disciples. Now, the New Testament uh, gives us this uh, recollection of obedience by the by the early church. Um, it shows how they were obedient and literally turned the world upside down for the gospel. So here's what evangelism looks like when it is done out of the love for the lost. We always hear that term. Well, we quite often hear that term. 
uh, we ought to have a love for the lost, a burden for the lost. So let me read you some scripture. I'm going to, I'm going to pull up my Bible. Uh, first stop will be in uh, the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 9. Let me pull that up. Uh, Romans chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 3. Romans 9, 1 through 3. So here is the word of the Lord. Let me get it pulled up. Hopefully you've got your Bible pulled up too. All right, here we go. Romans 9, 1 through 3. So I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I have great sorrow and un unceasing anguish in my heart. So listen to those words. Great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So, that should be a demonstration of love to the degree of self-sacrifice and obedience and love. A genuine burden. There's a genuine burden for the lost that drives, that drives evangelism. So let's go back a little, a, a little bit in the gospel according to Luke chapter 19. Let's turn there. Luke chapter 19. We'll look at verses 41 through 44. This is Jesus as he displays love for the lost in the way that he weeps. So this is, uh, let's, uh, let's look at this. Let me get my verses turned down to it. That's uh, Luke chapter 19, verses. So this is after Jesus' triumphant entry into the city and uh, his uh, right uh, going into that week right before uh, the Lord dives and made his way down to the Mount of Olives. All right. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem at, in these scripture, but listen to what he says. And when he drew near to the city, he wept over it. When's the last time you wept over the lost? Here's what he says. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and it will tear down to the ground you, your children within you, and they will not leave one stone turned upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And they would have rejected Christ. And Jesus shed a tear over the lost in that city. Again, having love and compassion on those that shake their fist in the face of God. Sometimes we get angry when people do that. When they are against the gospel, they are against Christ, but we must show love and compassion. And then we find ultimately God's ultimate love in the sense that he sent his only son uh, in those verses in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he sent his only unique or begotten son that whosoever will, whosoever will, that believeth in him, believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. So evangelism must be done out of obedience, must be done out of, out of love for, uh, for, for the lost. In fact, that is the bedrock of evangelism, is the love for God okay, and the love for other people. Because in this regard, love for others, it goes against every fiber of self-sufficiency, self-centeredness. Okay. So, those are some things that we talk about when we talk of what drives evangelism. Okay. Evangelism properly motivated. It turns our lives outward for others by sharing the good news and walking in accordance with, uh, with the good news. Okay. Lastly, a biblical understanding and practice of evangelism is essential for church health. It's just a a no-brainer, and we could use the term evangelism and outreach interchangeably. I hope that we do, understanding that outreach should be and must be evangelism. It seems to be a no-brainer because the kingdom of Christ is not going to grow or the local church will not grow unless there is outreach, unless there is evangelism. 
And so that seems to be a no a no brainer. It is essential for church health. Healthy churches uh, should be and must be rooted in a God centered message, and you know, and not man centered. And that's the importance of the gospel. It is not man centered. Okay, it is not man centered. Uh, healthy churches will put this false notion of uh, false evangelism to, to rest, hopefully. You know, that it is not uh, apologetics, although we can use apologetics. It is not our personal testimony, although we can use our testimony. It, it is not my opinion about the gospel. It is truth. It is not social justice or social gospel. Uh, it is the gospel, and, and, and anything that we do as a good work must have the gospel uh, engaged and intact with with it. So, as we are a God-centered, Christ-centered, biblical-centered church, then evangelism and the good news naturally flows. Uh, naturally flows from the healthy churches um, should want to put an end to uh, this idea of what we might call false evangelism or the things that evangelism is not. Okay, so when we go out, we don't. We don't want to do a good work and get a pat on the back, right? We don't want to stand and boast of all that we've done. Uh, if anything, in anything we boast, it's the boast in Christ. You know, uh, I know sometimes we like getting reports. I like hearing reports. People come back from off a mission trip. They come, you know, from from uh, from doing a good work. I love to hear those uh, those reports of how people, you know, have been engaged in the community and culture. And how God has been moving in those ministries. I love to, to hear that thing. But we also have to be careful at the same time that we're not boasting of self and what we have done, but boasting of what Christ is, is doing. And so a healthy church will want to put an end uh, and will want to detour those health, these unhealthy aspects of, uh, of false evangelism. Okay. Evangelism also is, um, it is not... Um, it is not what we would find in revival services either. Because sometimes we look at if revivals as uh, this massive outreach. When in fact revival is supposed to be for the church to be revived so they can go out and engage. Okay? Revival is not a, uh, in, fact, in fact the worship services should not be catered to sinners. Uh, you, that might seem to be odd that I would say that. A worship service is, is catered to, to the Lord, first and foremost, but it is, uh, it is directed to okay, believers who come to worship to be edified, to be built up, to grow in their faith, so that they might go out into the world. Uh, I think we spend much too, much too long in ordering uh, of service in trying to cater to the, to the unbeliever. Okay, that should not be. Uh, in fact, when we come to revival services, or we have revivals, it is to gain strength and learn the word and draw closer to one another and to Christ so that we go out into the world and are engaged in evangelism. So evangelism is not simply and merely found in revival service. Now, people have been saved in revival services, and praise the Lord for that, and I'm glad that that happens uh, when, when that happens, okay? Healthy churches understand that God is at work in the gospel. God is moving. God is at work. When the word is proclaimed, there's a work going on. Whether or not that person responds then and there, there is, God is doing a work. Whether or not that person responds, uh, if anything, you know, they've heard the good news, and so now they are without excuse. Okay, so God is doing a work in, in the sharing of, of, of the gospel. Okay, so those are some things to think about. Um, last week we talked about conversion. This week we talked about evangelism, you know, and so I want to leave you with a couple of discussion questions, some questions that you can ask. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully they will be beneficial uh, to, to you, and some of this will be review. But I want you to jot these down and uh, think about them and uh, come back and we'll, um, you know, maybe next week we'll discuss them a little bit. Uh, again, uh, thank you for joining 
me tonight about uh, what makes a healthy church and the aspect of evangelism. Some, some things evangelism is not, some things evangelism is, uh, and dividing the truth from error is always important. We always want to know what, uh, we always want to know truth. Okay, listen, we're drawing closer to the July 5th reopening day here at the church. We'll come together and worship. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to fill uh, every other pew and be able to worship. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to rid ourselves of, of distractions so that we can come together and worship in spirit and in truth. And, and, and anything that we have as far as distraction, we'll be able to cast them on the Lord when we come and meet. Uh, there'll be more coming uh, within the next few days uh, about, um, you know, about July 5th. Uh, hopefully you received a letter explaining that uh, that day. And uh, we'll be looking... We'll be We'll be looking to worship uh, this coming Sunday uh, on the, at the front of the church. We'll have a special guest preacher on that day, uh, which, will, uh, which will be Thomas Barber. He will be leading the morning uh, time of worship uh, as far as bringing the word, so you'll, you'll want to tune into that. Listen, I'll be praying for you. You pray for me. Any questions you might have about any, uh, anything we have going on here at the church behind the scenes or, or in front of you, uh, you can feel free to call the church office or you can call me also. For those who have my cell phone, uh, feel free to give me a call. Drop me a message. Uh, I would love to pray with you. Uh, hopefully you'll be praying for me until we meet again. May God bless you richly.